The Holy Gospel this morning is recorded in Matthew 5, verses 21 to 37. Glory be to you, O Lord. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell, hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gifts. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes and no, or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. This is the gospel of the Lord. And grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Chuck Swindoll, in his book, The Finishing Touch, tells the following story. A, a story about the great Polish pianist and statesman, Ignacy Jan Paderewski. A story about a time when he was scheduled to perform a at a great concert hall in America. And in attendance that evening was a mother with her nine-year-old son. Now this mother had had to drag her son along. She had hoped that maybe if he saw a great master like Paderewski at the Keys, maybe this little boy would start taking his piano lessons a little more seriously. And so the concert hall fills that evening. Everyone's abuzz with excitement. Everyone, of course, except this little boy who's been forced to come and is squirming in his seat. His mother at one point turns to talk to someone next to them and that little boy quietly slips out of his chair at that moment and, and runs down the aisle. He runs all the way up to the stage and there he finds himself mesmerized by the sight of that enormous concert grand piano. He runs up to the piano, sits down on the tufted leather seat and puts his little hands on those ivory keys and he starts playing. Playing chopsticks, that is. And of course, immediately there's a hush over the entire auditorium. Everyone turns with a frown on their face. A few people in irritation even cry out, get that kid off the stage. Where's his mother? Stop him. Now, of course, the great Paderewski, he's backstage. And when he hears the commotion and discovers what's going on, he immediately walks out on stage. But he doesn't address the audience. No, he walks up right behind that little boy, puts both arms on either side of him, and he starts playing a counter melody. And he whispers all the while in the little boy's ears, hey, buddy, don't stop. Just keep going. We're doing this. We're going we're gonna to do a great job. Don't quit, son. Just keep on playing. Now, of course, Swindoll, he adds this commentary at the end. He says, Sometimes it's just like that for us in life. You know how it is. We hammer away at life and, and maybe sometimes it can feel about as significant as playing chopsticks. I mean, especially our Christian lives. You know, the Christian vocations that God has given us, the service that we do for the Lord in everyday ways. Sometimes the sinner in us just wonders, is it worth it? We grow weary. 
We wonder, am I even on the right path in life? Do I need to find another direction? And then maybe just at about this point where we're about to give up, along comes the master who leans over us and with his word whispers to us, don't quit. Keep on going. We've got this. And at just the right moment, he provides the perfect touch of his love and his grace and joy. Now, you know, I, I think in all the Bible, there's probably no one who understood that frustration sometimes that comes with serving the Lord better than Moses. The author of our Old Testament text today from Deuteronomy 30, 30 15 to 20 he was acutely aware of just how frustrating it can be to serve the Lord, especially in everyday kind of ways. Even how difficult and frustrating it can be sometimes to serve God's people. I mean, Moses, despite all of his desire to be faithful to the Lord and to lead God's people in faithfulness, so often for his efforts, all he received was rejection and hostility, false accusations, and sometimes just out-and-out -out hatred. And so sometimes you read through the book of Exodus and you wonder, what kept this guy going? Why did he finish the task God gave him to do? Why didn't he quit? <laughs> now, of course, Moses, I think, gives us the answer to that today in our text. He writes, these are his words. He says, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Now choose life. So that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. Now, these were words he spoke right before God's people were going to enter into the promised land. And what kept Moses going throughout his ministry? Why didn't he quit? Well, I think it's because Moses was convinced that what he was doing was in the service of life. You see, it's not that Moses could see the future. He didn't know how it was all necessarily going to turn out in the end. He didn't see what tomorrow held, but he was absolutely convinced of this. That the consequences of quitting, the consequences of leaving the service of the Lord, would have been paramount to choosing eternal death. And so he says, today I set before you life and death, blessings and curses, but choose life. The Lord is your life. And what an awesome motto. What an awesome phrase. The Lord is your life. Indeed, to whom else would we go? Who else would we follow? Who else would we serve? The Lord is your life. I mean, money isn't your life. Power isn't your life. Work isn't your life. <laughs> A hobby is not your life. Pleasure is not your life. Convenience is not your life. Your husband is not your life. Your wife is not your life. Your children are not your life. Your parents are not your life. No, the Lord is your life. I mean, how many people believe that? How many people, even more so, how many people live that way? The Lord is your life. See, I think we have this terrible tendency a lot of times to want to fill our lives with things that in the end are simply not life. Oh, they may grant us a little joy in the present moment. They may even provide a little meaning and purpose for our lives today, but ultimately they are false substitutes for life. And they most certainly cannot give us what God gives us in and through Jesus Christ. And yet a lot of times we run after these false visions for life. And like I said, they may fill up our present moment with some joy, some pleasure, a little meaning and purpose right now, but they really can't give us any true joy or true meaning for the future. I mean, we don't know what the future holds. And you know how it is then. A lot of times today, oh, we have great plans. Wouldn't it be cool if, and we set all these goals for the future and we start working toward them finding this meaning and purpose, and then what happens? What, a week later, a month later, a year later, our circumstances change completely, and everything's got to change along with them. No, indeed. There can be no real joy or meaning 
that can be found in these false visions for life. No, as God's people, we know that the only thing that can give us real joy, real purpose, real meaning for our future is Jesus Christ. Because he is the only thing that's constant, the only thing that is eternal. He's the one that we should shape our lives around. So how do we do this? I mean, after all, we want to take action, right? We're Christians. We want to know how, how can we, you know, set our life on the right course. Oh, how many times I've heard people ask, Pastor, you know, how do I know what God's will is for my life then? What path do I pursue? We wonder at every fork in the road, am I making the right choice? Do I go to college right after high school? Or do I immediately start working? Or how do I know if the person I'm dating is the one? How do I know if my marriage is worth fighting for? Or should I throw in the towel and file for divorce? Is my job really worth it? All the stress, all the hard work, or should I find another career? Do I stay? Do I go? What is God's will? Right? All these questions, all these choices, all these dilemmas that we face. And you know, I think sometimes this anxiety concerning what is God's will for my life, it, it, it stems from a myth that I think is very persistent among us Christians. A myth that goes like this. A myth that says that God has one and only one very specific plan for your life. One very specific path that he wants you to walk. And he has planned out every single step of it exactly. And he has a specific set of choices that he wants you to make. Now, of course, he hasn't told you any of that or what all that might be. No, somehow you've got to try to figure it out, right? Right? Somehow you have to try to discern all this in the dark and hope and pray that you get it right. I want to tell you, that's a myth. I mean, what a miserable existence the Christian life would be if that were the case. I mean, every time we'd encounter trouble in the present moment, it would only cause us to look back at our previous choices and wonder, did we make the right choice? <laughs> Second-guessing everything, doubting everything, scared of everything. We'd have no real peace, especially concerning the future. I mean, how can you have peace when you're constantly looking over your shoulder in the dark, wondering if you're going the right way? I mean, the pagans, they live this way. This is where superstition and all that stuff comes from. You and I, we know the Lord. Why would we ever look at life like that? In fact, I'm convinced that this is the very reason God has hidden the future from us in the first place. For the very reason so that we might trust him and trust him alone. And not trust ourselves, because you know we would. We'd be looking at our choices and all the time, trying to figure out how we can most influence the future. No, indeed, God has determined that we walk by faith, not by sight. And yeah, sure, sometimes living life, the Christian life, can feel a lot like playing chopsticks. Sometimes all we can see is, and indeed, all we really can see is the past. All we can do is look backwards, and yeah, sure, we probably see a lot of things in our past that we regret, choices that we made that we wish we had done differently, both the good and the bad. <laughs> but you know what? Even amidst those choices, when you and I look at the past by faith, you and I are privileged to see that even despite any failings that we had, any mistakes that we made, any bad choices that we made, all the while God was at work, still working for us, working for our good and bringing forth his blessings in our lives. You see, there's only one specific thing that the Bible tells us concerning God's will for our lives. And that's this, and it's pretty simple. God's will for your life and for my life is that we be his children. And so determined is he about that, that he, <laughs> he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die for you and me. To live and die for us. Through Christ, our sins, our failures, all the things that we might look at in the past and regret, he's completely covered over. In Christ, we have all that we need to perfectly please God. God is totally satisfied with us. And why? Because of everything Jesus has done. And you know what? You and I had no choice in the matter. 
Jesus made the choice to do that for us. The Holy Spirit called you to faith. God the Father determined from the foundations of time itself to accomplish all this for you and for me. We had no say in the matter. And so, thank goodness, that is one decision you and I don't ever have to sweat about. We're children of God because of all that God has chosen to do for us. Now, what about all the other stuff then in life, the things we worry about concerning God's will? Well, you know what? Most of that stuff is up for grabs. I mean that. We have been given lots of freedom in regard to pretty much everything else about our life. We get to decide what we want to do and pursue in each and every beautiful day that the Lord makes for us. We get to live our lives pursuing things that use our talents and our gifts that God has given us. We have all this freedom provided that there's only one caveat that we live by. And that caveat is this, that since we are children of God, then we live our lives in his image and we seek the glory of his name. Right? We seek with every choice that we make and with everything that we do to glorify God's name. You see, that's what Moses is telling the Israelites in Deuteronomy. He's reminding them that their one chief goal in the new life that they will live in this promised land is that they glorify God as God's people. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and the length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. You see, along the road of life, yeah, we're going to face a lot of trouble and hard times. But there's going to be lots of prosperity and blessing along the way too. Blessing and curse, as Moses says it. I mean, this is a sinful world after all. Who knows what might happen? We'll definitely make some bad choices, <laughs> sinful choices. But praise be to God for the free forgiveness won for us by Jesus. Precisely because of that forgiveness given to us, not chosen by us, you and I can always walk with absolute confidence into the future. Even when the going gets rocky or rough, we can have confidence because we know that God has given us his word. He's given us the Bible. He's given us the Ten Commandments. He's given us holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. In these things we find all the wisdom we need for life. We find, even more importantly, the forgiveness for our sins and you know what? Those are the only two things that we need to glorify God and live our lives in his honor. These are the things we need to do his work, to accomplish his will, his word, and the forgiveness of sins. You know, I think that's what makes church such a great place for Christians then. Because you know, it's right here at St. Paul each and every week that we get those very things. God's word and the forgiveness of sins. It's here that we get to be reminded that we are children of God, that we're a part of his incredible work in this world, of making the gospel known in so many various ways. It's here that we get to be reminded that we get to use our lives and that we get to make so many choices concerning the way that will glorify his name uh, through his people, through his family, through his church. Today, may we use some of God's, our God-given freedom to make choices. And whatever those choices may be, may they glorify the name of the Lord and give us peace for the future. In Jesus' name, amen.